tonight's talk, we have a wonderful guest speaker tonight. He is our new department head. Uh, his name is, of course, Frank Lowe's, He's right over here on this side. Got a little bit to read for you. Uh, he has a 22-year history here in the, uh, at NC State in research, extension, and leadership. He arrived at NC State in 1996 as an assistant professor in the Department of Entomology and Plant Pathology. He's risen through the professional ranks and focused on integrated pest management and sustainable agricultural practices and uh, uh, practices for small fruits and vegetables. Before, before becoming a department head, uh, he served as the director of the NSF Center for IPM at NC State, and in that role he coordinated interdisciplinary research and extension teams, uh, cultivated local and global partnerships, and trained uh, the next generation of IPM practic uh, practitioners. Frank holds a bachelor's and a master's degree in plant pathology from the University of Guelph in Ontario, and a doctorate in plant pathology from Michigan State University. We're very happy to have Frank here, and the floor is all yours, Frank. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Well, it's really great to be here. You know, um, I speak, I've spoken many times in this arboretum uh, and in this room, uh, but not in the department head, so it feels like home. You know, this is really a good feeling. This is great space, and uh, glad to have you all here tonight. And let's see, it's a little hot still, isn't it? Turn it down. All right, there we go. I tend to be a loudspeaker also, so there you go. Um, yeah, so uh, I didn't realize you're going to read such a long list. So as he, as he mentioned, I'm from Ontario, Canada. So I felt really at home this week. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the joke is when we moved from Michigan, we just threw everything in the truck. And we threw our cross-country skis in there, too. It's like, why did we do that going to North Carolina? But you know what? We have used them almost every year. <laughs> and so this, uh, this, this uh, last couple days, man, it's been great. You know, uh, my wife and I, we do cross-country skiing. We have some property. We've got all these trails. And it's just a wonderful time. The nice thing about North Carolina is, though, the snow goes away. <laughs> it doesn't stick around for too long. Um, this is a slide I, we just took here on December 1st, and some of you are here. I see uh, uh, some of the volunteers. Cape Fear, of course, got severely affected by uh, Cape Fear Botanical Gardens. Got uh, really hit hard by the hurricane. And so a bunch of people from our department and a bunch of volunteers from the Arboretum went down and we did a work day. And it was a really enjoyable, really good for uh, helping people out. We had, uh, you know, a number of kids, some teenagers. This is actually my son here and his girlfriend, and then uh, a bunch of arboretum volunteers and personnel. And uh, yeah, you know, they they had the hurricane, and a short while later they had more flooding. In fact, like that tree didn't fall down until the second storm after the hurricane. They got all those tra trails cleared and then bang, more, more damage. So we just thought it was great if a sister arboretum and a sister horticulture can go and visit there and help them. Uh, and you know, you might remember people at Christmas. I know there's a lot of toy drives for people who are victims of hurricanes, etc. So a lot of opportunity to serve well. Um, what I wanted to do, I wanted to dance a little bit about what I've done. Not too much. And then I'd just like to talk about, I come from a plant pathology background, and just talking about problems and how to solve problems, but I'll use a lot of illustrations from gardening. Now, mostly, I'm a fruit and vegetable person. So if you ask me about certain ornamental plant species, especially in the south, I am not that strong. But that's why Chris and Tony are here, right? <laughs> and Tim and Doug. We can deflect it. Yeah, Doug, that's here, right? Yeah, excellent. So we got a, we got a bunch of people. Um, but I, I, uh, I love the land-grant system in the U.S. And I've, I've served in the land-grant system now for, uh, since I've been here 23 years. I was 70% extension, 30% research. And what I really love about that is it's a real dance between the sciences of plants as well as the practice of using plants. Right? So I call this the, the dance between practice and science. And I'll touch on that uh, more. But you know, typically, most faculty in extension, they would have a primary clientele. So mine, mine were small fruits and vegetables. And I, I did a lot of work with strawberries and tomatoes. And then you know, it, it was my job to find out what information is in the world. And then uh, you know, what are the problems for our stakeholders and to work with the stakeholders. 
and then to figure out how can we solve those problems. So we might implement field or lab uh, work, and then to package that information that's really helpful to people for people to make decisions, right? Recommendations, how to manage diseases, how to grow your plants, and then you know, to package it and get up. And it's it's a constant feedback feedback loop. And uh, I really enjoyed it because you you just interact with people so much and help make decisions. Um, you know, with your stakeholders. And so the, the land grant system is a great place to be. You know, I've traveled a lot internationally, and, and a lot of times there's a D link between the people who do science and the people who make the recommendations. But here, you know, in the land grant system, it's all linked together. And I think that's really made agriculture very successful in the U.S. This is, this is just one example of the type of work we did. You know, most of our strawberries, tomatoes, peppers, watermelons, etc., in North Carolina are grown on these raised beds with plastic. And that soil gets fumigated. So there's a gas that goes in there and it kills all the pathogens and the weeds. And we used to use a chemical called methyl bromide. And it's an ozone depleting compound, just like the CFCs from refrigerants. Right, so we got rid of all those. And so a, the international rule came out that we need to eliminate methyl bromide from our agricultural uses. And it was fuzzy science because you couldn't really measure, okay, how much does methyl bromide contribute to the ozone hole? It was hard to really say. But we, you know, when I came, I felt like, you know what, we got to address this. We start, we start locally, we think globally. So we just did a lot of work with growers to think about, well, how else can we grow fruits and vegetables in North Carolina without using this, this chemical? And the long and short of it is, you know, we had a lot of different types of experiments. Uh, here's the size of the ozone hole in 2005. And then it went to a lot of international groups. Um, this is John Vollmer, he's in Bonn, North Carolina. Uh, he, he recently passed away, um, but a really great innovator. So we worked a lot with farmers. And the long and short of it is, the whole U.S. pretty much is now off of methyl bromide. And, and what this shows is, is the amount of bromine in the atmosphere, and the model said, if we continue to get rid of methyl bromide, this will be how much, bro how much bromine will go down over time. But in actuality, it went down faster than we thought, which suggested that the agricultural use of this fumigant did more damage to the ozone hole than we thought. So it was, it's, it's kind of a great story because in the sense that, well, we really got to help our growers, but it has an impact on the ozone hole, right, in the long term. And so that was, um, you know, that was a major part of the work that we did. And along the way, we just discovered a lot about the biology of the pathogens that cause disease. And then this is in a strawberry farm. This is over by Winston-Salem. See all these growers, and uh, this is a person who worked in my program. And we'd have field days, and we'd talk about the problems, we'd talk about how to solve those problems. Uh, and then we did a lot of agent training. These are all extension agents or other specialists trained the trainers. You know, so that we could get that information out uh, throughout the whole state. And, and North Carolina is great because every county still has an extension office, and there's really good people there. So if you have a question, uh, you know, your county is the first place to go to, uh, and, and your master gardeners and, and your county agents. So this really, you know, shows the practice and the dance between practice and science, discovering new information, getting it out to people, and then. And, you know, working on a university is such an enjoyable thing. Uh, you know, we have, these are all high schoolers. We put on, uh, you know, science fair days and high schoolers come and it breaks the ice for them what the university is like. You know, one of the kids after we did this, he said, man, I met that professor. And he's like a real person. <laughs> right? So it's like, okay, we're breaking the ice for these young people, right? And, um, um, uh, these two gentlemen are, are have been leaders in the organic industry, and uh, Bill Dow and Tony Cleese, uh, both of them recently passed away. Uh, but this is where we are doing grafting uh, training in, in with tomatoes, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, but just a great celebration of opportunities at the university. And, um, you know, when I think about uh, in, being in horticulture, um, 
what we do, you know, I, I really feel that horticulture does make a difference. You know, we advance the science, but we always have that mission in mind, right? We want to get new varieties. We want to get um, uh, better fertility. We want to learn better pruning practices, etc. And so, um, you know, the goal is to enhance the relationships with many people in the state. And then, of course, what happens also, I'm really impressed by horticulture, how many people support the department through endowments and stuff for students. And that's really, really good. Uh, especially this, this in, in our climate, it's, it's harder and harder to come by uh, with money for education and training programs and, and for research. Then, um, I also worked in the Center for IPM, and here's the team. Again, you know, we just constantly celebrate people. And, and what this group did, it, they did a lot of different things, but um, one of the things we did was we would search all over the world for anything, any pathogen, insect, or weed that's a threat to the U.S. agriculture or our ecosystems. And then we would database that. And then the USDA would use that database to make decisions at the borders, real-time decisions. Hmm. You know, should this shipment come in or not? What's the level of risk that the shipment brings? So it might be grapes out of Chile. You know, it might be oranges out of China. And, and, do, uh, and we did a lot of work about how to prevent organisms from getting in. Like, how do you assess the risk? And when they come in, how do you sample you know, a boatload of containers, right? And so, um, so we did a lot of that type of work of preventing invasives. Um, and just as one example, um, the old world bollworm is a threat to the U.S. It's kind of like, um, like some of the insects we already have on corn, uh, but this one affects a wider range of crops. And so it is in South America, and it is um, in Central America, and so it is a threat, potential threat to the U.S. And so what some of the people in the center did is, you know, just using the best tools that are available, so GIS tools, so you map the whole of USA, you can know the temperatures, you can know where the plants are, and then you can predict where's the most likely threat of this organism going to be. And, um, and, and where it will multiply, even through different climatic conditions. So that's just the type of work that some of the people did in the center. This is Dr. Yu Takeuchi who put it together. But it's just taken as much of the science that's available to figure out what's the risk to U.S. agriculture. All right, and then just great grad students, you know, and this is, I love this picture. This is the, this is the new class of graduates in horticulture, and of, 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 of graduate students. All right, so we have 56 graduate students, and uh, I'm just going to dance a little bit through some horticulture stuff. Um, and some of them, this person just recently defended. Um, so some of them are on the way out. He just finished his PhD. Uh, you know, he's got two really potentially good job offers. Uh, and generally, you know, students do really well uh, coming on the program. And, you know, as part of horticulture, we just, uh, in fact, I just handed this in yesterday. You know, every 10 years, they review the department to see how we're doing with our graduate students. And then so, you know, this, this study gets put together, and then we uh, respond to that study about how we can improve. And then next week, I meet with the provost to, to articulate, you know, what our needs are, what our goals are, and just to continuously advance and sharpen, you know, our, our educational program. And likewise, you know, one thing with uh, horticulture is um, we want to be able to reach students through the whole state. And it's getting really competitive to get an NC State. You know, so how do you, how do you make sure the level of diversity of students can come to state? And so there's a lot of programs that are developing at 2 plus 2. You can start in a local community college and then go to NC State. It's all lined up that way. And another method is to, uh, to get students into, into NC State and into the horticulture. You know, there's a lot of need in horticulture for well-trained um, students. And students, they have a lot of clubs and activities and just, uh, just some great pictures. They do plant sales and stuff. So we have undergrad students and graduate students um, that are advancing the horticulture sciences. And then um, this is just a picture of a lot of the faculty and in the department. You know, uh, we're committed to teaching, research, and outreach. 
And it really is the art and science of permaculture. I mean, you, you rock these grounds and it's, it's artfully done, right? It's not just science. And a lot of people, when they um, retire from horticulture, they don't retire. They come back and they work uh, because because it's who they are. I mean, it is an art, right? It's an expression of yourself, uh, and I'm sure that's why many of you are into gardening. <coughs> and then we're going to be developing a strategic plan. You know how to think about the future, and, and um, you know the arboretum will be part of that. And so I'll be leading that, uh, the department into that. Um, let me skip that. And uh, so let me go over to gardening. This is my garden. All right, a bunch of shots from my place. So I live in Franklin County, and a bit of a drive, and, uh, but I really like it. We're on the Roseville Plateau, have a really nice soil. Um, and you know, I have a lot of perennial gardens that I've built over the years. I, I mostly work, I, I mostly grow fruits and vegetables. That's where I put a lot of my energy. So I learned when it comes to um, And so these are some of the <laughs> fruits of my labor, so to say. So, yeah. but, it's just a part of um, but you know, why do we garden? I just, I just grab a, a lot of these things. You know, it's, it feeds who you are, and it, it feeds what you enjoy. And, uh, you know, when I, after we moved there, this is uh, 18 years ago, I'd come home and, you know, life was really busy, and I'd just go walk on the land. And then after a while, my wife says to me, she says, Frank, I think you love the land more than me. <laughs> All right? So I learned when I come home, I kiss my wife, then I walk the land. <laughs> so, but it's just a part of who you are. And this is, this is my son, who I showed you the picture before, right, when he was... He's a bit younger here, um, but he's, he was, all my kids were uh, very outdoorsy, but he, he is particular, you know, and so it just, it just, uh, uh, you develop community, it uh, grows your family, uh, it's just an enjoyable thing to do. Um, but it's not always a bed of roses, right? <laughs> this is a poem from the 1500s. I will make thee beds of roses and a thousand fragrant poisons, a cap of flowers and a kirtle embroidered all with leaves of myrtle. And so most of my career has been solving problems here where, where things aren't a bed of roses, where there are problems. And so I'm just going to kind of dance through that uh, and give, give some examples and stories. Um, and so when we, thought, when we talk about disease, you know, normally, you know, you know what the plant should normally look like. In any impairment of that plant, you would call it a disease. So it could be something biological, right? And, uh, uh, usually a pathogen, or it could be something non-biological, right? Like uh, high salts or cold injury or heat injury. And then diagnosis is just how to figure out what that problem is. And you know, a lot of these things, I felt like you know. It's kind of like raising kids, it's kind of like marriage, it's kind of like interpersonal relationships. You know, you just really got to understand the core of what's going on and then work from there, right? Um, so, uh, I have this um, pyramid and, you know, we also need to think about, okay, well, what are the solutions and how do we, how do we uh, find solutions? And, and one of the most important things, and, and you know, that's why it's enjoyable to have you all here and, and, and why you come to these things, is because your personal knowledge is probably the, the most important asset you have. You know, at some point, it might come time to spray, but your personal knowledge, you know, having the right plant selections, choosing them for the right environment, planting them in the right way at the right time, etc., you know, will avoid a lot of the problems. And so just gaining that knowledge, and again, yeah, I find it really disturbing when someone comes to me and says, oh, Frank, we built this, uh, this greenhouse and we're growing tomatoes and we've got some problems. And I say, well, uh, who's your extension person? They say, well, we don't know about extension. And there's, there's all this history of information and knowledge that you can get, you know, before you start, uh, start on those kind of businesses, right? So. And then, I don't know, probably most of you have seen this, right? We call this the disease triangle. And so the disease triangle says, well, if you're going to have disease, you need a pathogen. This is a fungus, this is bacteria. And then, of course, the pathogen hits the plant that we're concerned about, and you need the right environmental conditions for that disease to occur. And so we call that the disease triangle, and, and uh, we call that plant pathology 101. 
But it's also a great way to think about how to manage problems, right? And so, for example, um, you know, if you can get rid of the pathogen, what's what's one way that you might focus on the pathogen if you have a problem? What's one tool that you might use? And tomatoes, use them when you buy tomatoes. Excellent. Get, get, get disease-free seeds or if you're a pr propagation material. So you eliminate the pathogen from the system. So that's that. That whole process is focused on the pathogen. So that's excellent. What about environment? What's something you might do in the environment to, to control the problem or limit the problem? Tomato, tomato, Crop rotation, right. So you're changing your soils, all right, and so that soil environment will be more conducive to your plan. And you're also focusing on the pathogen, because hopefully the pathogen will decrease. And then, of course, the host, selecting the right host, you know, getting the right resistance. And tomatoes, usually when you buy tomatoes on the seed packet, it says VFNT. What does that mean to you, if you see that? Yeah, vertically well, so that's V, F, fusarium resistance, N, nematode. nematode, T, tomato mosaic virus, right? But it's, this can be true with any plant, right? If you're, if you're planting <laughs> ornamentals or uh, any plant, you want to select the right plants for the right environment and hopefully they have disease resistance. Now, you know, I, I do a lot of work with organic growers too. And, uh, you know, I don't know, you know, almost everybody grows tomatoes, but, uh, you know, the leaves often get this blight, and it's called early blight. And we get it every year, especially in wet seasons. So the organic growers say, Frank, what can I do to control early blight? And I think, okay, you know what? You can't control the pathogen because it's always around. In North Carolina, we always get lots of rain, so you can't really control the environment very well. So I tell them, don't grow tomatoes. <laughs> Get rid of the host, <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, that only goes well over so well, right? <laughs> but they do have high tunnels. And you think, well, we don't need more heat units in North Carolina. But the reason they have high tunnels with open sides is because of preventing the rain. All right, so it's about managing leaf wetness. Uh, to limit the amount of disease. So these are just really helpful. Like if you have a problem, you think, and as you get to know it, can I, can I affect the pathogen or can I change the environment? Uh, maybe you gotta prune so you get better air movement in your canopy, etc. Or do I need to think about different hosts? And then the other thing is in North Carolina, you know, we have such different environmental conditions. Uh, one time I had uh, a consultant told me from Eastern North Carolina, he's Frank, I got tomatoes that are wilted, I think it's vertically and well. I said, no, it's not. And I, I'm sure he thought, gee, where's that guy's coming from? <laughs> I didn't even look at the plant. He didn't tell me anything about it. But verticillium is a temperate pathogen. It likes it cool. It's only a mountain pathogen. It's not an Eastern North Carolina pathogen, right? Late blight of tomato. Well, we just get that in the mountains. Now and then we get it here, but not very often. You know, so knowing where you are uh, really affects, uh, you want to get ecologically, you know, um, specific uh, practices and plants. And then just a few things, you know, how do diseases occur and where do pathogens come from? Uh, as mentioned, uh, well, some, some will be on the plants and you'll get lesions and as long as there's plant debris, then that pathogen stays. And so that's really important to know because if you till it under or if you rotate, that's a really good way to get rid of that pathogen. And so just knowing that biology is important. So we call those soil invaders. They'll invade for a while. When the residue's gone, they're gone. But then we have soil inhabitants. We mentioned verticillium, fusarium. These are type of fungi that once in the soil, they're always in the soil. What's your, if, you, if you're growing vegetables, what's your most hated disease on a tomato, say? Blossom end rot. OK, yeah, so that's a, that's a nutrient disorder. Yeah, so that's a calcium from a calcium. And so, um, and so that's really important to diagnose if it's blossom end rot or something else because uh, the way the soil gets watered, the main goal there is to try to maintain as much constant water as possible because that calcium has to move with the water into the plant and you don't want to over fertilize 
because then all that calcium tends to go to the young leaves, and then that fruit right at the end doesn't give enough calcium. And that calcium is like the pectate you put in jam. If you, if you don't have that hardening substance, your jam is like mush. Or calcium holds those layers of cells together. Without calcium, it just collapses. And so it's a, it's a very unique. What about another problem in, in tomatoes? And I'm, I'm thinking we have a lot. You know, that's the most, one of the more common things in gardens that I see. Bacterial wilt, that's the one. <laughs> it's a terrible one. Once it's in the soil, it's, it's terrible. The whole world knows it as Granville wilt. In 1896, it was first found in Granville County, North Carolina. Hmm. All right, so we have a great reputation worldwide as having a terrible disease of tomato and tobacco. <laughs> Um, the other is mentioned, you know, it comes on seed or propagation material, and so we want clean seed. And then lots come on insects, and then some diseases and, and problems, of course, are perennial on, on the plants. And so we might prune them away or have some other uh, type of wet mechanism or way to control it. So the key is, is, is know your enemy. So if, if you have a consistent problem, you know, try to learn about its biology, and then um, and how, to, well, how to diagnose it and, and then learn its biology. Because everything has a weak link. For example, um, powdery mildew on apples can be a very serious problem. But that organism can only live in association with living tissue. So what happens um, with apples, it might, the fungus be growing on, would be growing on the leaf, and as that bud sets in the fall, that fungus crawls inside because it has to be associated with living tissue. And then when that bud breaks in the spring, then the powdery mildew becomes active, and then that fungus gets on the leaves. Well, if you're going to spray, one spray at bud set can control that pathogen rather than spraying every week through the summer. Right? One spray, because that's its weak link. It needs this bridge to go from the summer from the fall to the next spring in that part. And so that's, that's what you know, the science does and helps us make decisions about when to, when to control it. Um, so then, you know, uh, a lot of times uh, I say, well, you gotta know your client. You know, am I dealing with a homeowner or who am I dealing with, right? One time I was at home, it was nine o'clock on a Wednesday night, the phone rings. This guy phones me and says, Frank, we got a problem with tomatoes on the eastern shore of Virginia. I'm thinking, okay. He says, can you come out tomorrow morning and look at it? <laughs> well, that's pretty presumptuous, man. Uh, of course, I didn't say that, right? I said, well, it's a long drive, <laughs> right? I said, I'm pretty sure I can rearrange my schedule, and I could be there, you know, such and such a time in the morning. He said, we'll send a plane to pick you up. <laughs> they flew into my county airport early in the morning. I hopped on the plane. I spent a whole day looking at the tomato problems, and I was home by night. Now, I haven't had too many home growers do that for me. <laughs> right? But that's the nature of this company. Big tomato operators, this is the way they, they fly from Florida to Virginia to get their, to, you know, to do their work, and they sent the plane uh, to pick me up. So, you know, that's a different clientele. And, and they were shipping truckloads of stuff, which turned to mush in Boston, and then not only did they lose all the money, but then they had to pay to somehow get that mush back. And so, you know, so that was a big deal. So when we think about pathogens, the most important group of pathogens are fungi. And then we have bacteria. And, uh, you know, of course, fungi, they grow on our bread when we leave them on the fridge too long. Green and blue and yellow stuff. And then viruses and then also nematodes. And I'm just going to uh, briefly dance. This is English ivy, and this is bacterial diseases, causing spots, and it produces a toxin, so we get a halo. Uh, there's a virus. Viruses typically always grow on the young tissue. And then if you send stuff to the clinic, you know, we have ELISA assays, and, and these type of assays, just like pregnancy tests, right? If the right protein is there from the virus, then we put these dipsticks, we crunch this up, we put this dipstick in, the liquid runs up, and then this is a positive control. So this says no virus, and this one, it turns purple, and says the virus is present. And so we can do that in the field, and man, the technology is just moving so fast about how to diagnose 
uh, some of these problems. And then a lot of viruses are spread by insects, so we can't focus on the virus because we can't do anything about it. So we focus on the insects. Like what I do is I, I sometimes I get tomato spot or little virus in my tomatoes very badly and peppers. And mouse ear chickweed is one of the most common overwintering organisms that harbors that virus and the thrips that spread it. So I try to control the mouse ear uh, chickweed uh, um, uh, from around my, uh, around my gardens, you know, as, as a potential threat to my tomatoes. And then, you know, a lot of times uh, you get circular, circular lesions or young growth, but sometimes the whole plant uh, can just turn red. And here's a mosaic, you know, and I'm sure everybody knows in the mid, in the 1500s and 1400s, people would sell their farms to buy tulips that gave variegated flowers. Right? And then lo and behold, those tulips were infected by a disease, a virus, right? And that's what made them look like that. You know, you get these different patterns you don't expect. Uh, so be there. Don't buy bones uh, for a certain variegation if you, if, 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 you know they're, if you don't know if they're virus-free. And then nematodes, um, very small worm-like. But what these are really interesting, they have the stylet. And that stylet can go back and forth, and so it penetrates the plant and causes disease. All right. And so I'm just going to dance through a few stories about diagnosis and, and just a few stories from the field, so to say. Um, when I think about diagnosing problems, we often think about signs and symptoms. And so signs where are like, like walking through the woods, you know that there's mycelium all under those leaves breaking down the tissue, right, the residue. But you usually don't see anything. But when a mushroom pops up, you know there's fungi growing under there. And that's the sign, is that mushroom, that the fungus is down in that uh, forest soil. And so just a few examples. Uh, oh, yeah, you know what? I wish I was an entomologist. Because let's say if you were in Colorado, and you're walking through a potato field, and you saw this bug, what would you call it? Colorado potato field. How used to use it? <laughs> right? Well, if you're walking in your garden, and you see your, on your tomatoes a worm that has a horn, you'd call it a tomato horn worm. Like, how, how easy is that? <laughs> Whereas you see that with pathogens, the challenge we have is this is a cell of a plant. Right? This is the head of the nematode, my ceiling of a fungus. This is bacteria, 10 millionth of a microns long. <coughs> and in viruses, you really need uh, high-end microscopes to see them. So usually when we have diseases, we can't see the organism. You know, it's not like the Colorado potato beetle or the hornworm, where we can see them and identify them. If we had to come up with a name, we would come up with the right name, right? <laughs> So that's a challenge, I think, with uh, pathogens and diseases. So you really need to be a detective. Um, and here's just some symptoms. This is in a tobacco greenhouse. It's got a root rot, but it's yellow, so we call it you know, corpses. This is scorch. This is a, a, a bacteria that lives in the plumbing system. So that leaf is not getting enough water, and so the ends start to dry out, and you have a scorch. This. <laughs> is a pumpkin with white mold growing on it, <laughs> which is a very common pathogen in North Carolina. But this is, uh, see, this is a sign that the fungus is there. And it's a grad student joke, that's what it is. <laughs> she grew this pathogen on her pumpkin. Yeah. This is powdery mildew, right? Many people see this, and you can see the white growth. So that's a sign that that fungus is there. So that's what you look for, is the signs and the symptoms. This is my, uh, some tomatoes, some tomato work we did. Well, it's just full of knots, right? Root knot nematode. And then you can break those knots open, and then you find the female here. You can see it's, a, it's about 40x the size. And the female turns from a worm into this reproductive factory. And she'll just have many, many eggs inside of her. And then right. those will hatch right. out, and the nematodes will keep on building up. So this is the symptom, the knot, and the sign is the actual 
a pathogen. Right, yeah, here's itself. Adrian's signature. This is bacterial wilt, so we see the symptom. The plumbing system is all brown in tomato. Well, first I and if we, the no, fastest no, no, no. way to tell if it's bacterial then, wilt, you know, maybe, we just maybe take a, a, a chunk of the tomato, we put it in water like this, and if white stuff streamed out of it, that's the bacteria oozing out. And it's just a really fast way to tell that that's what the problem is. Okay, so I wanted to do a little exercise here. I was going to get a piece of paper. And if you want to describe to somebody or if you want to look at the signature. Who's got a pen? You got a pen? All right. And it's Valerie, right? Yes. Valerie, write your name on there. Who's got a pen on this side? Anybody? All right. What's your name? Adrian. Okay, write your name on there. All right, and I'm going to take it back. All right. Um, here is Valerie's signature. All right, and let's get into Adrian's. All right, yeah, here's Adrian's signature. Okay, now. I'm going to mix it up. <laughs> well, first I would study it, and then I would mix it up. And then, you know, maybe, maybe 10 years from now, I'll come across it. That's Adrian. I recognize that signature. You know, she was at uh, the Arboretum. And Valerie, I recognize that signature. You know, everybody has a unique signature. And you look, you look for that, that signature over time. You look for over space. And really, when you're trying to diagnose a problem, and if you want to describe it to somebody or if you're trying to figure it out, you want to look at the signature. When did it occur? How widespread is it? And so every problem has a signature. Like, like when you said calcium uh, blossom end rot, I immediately know what that signature is. When it occurs and how it occurs. It typically occurs on the younger fruit. It typically occurs on plants that have high nitrogen content. It typically occurs when you have cases of oscillating water. Right? So, so all of these things have a signature. And, and that's really um, what diagnosis is in troubleshooting. Is understanding that signature, and so um, I, I defined signs and symptoms. I couldn't find a good definition for our signature, so I just made one up. We're allowed to do that in university. <laughs> <laughs> it's a specific, you know, um, occurrence of signs and symptoms over time and over space, and then how those symptoms and signs come together. And so I'm just going to dance through a few examples. You know, typically. Um, if I do a training and identification, especially for master gardeners, that's what I do. It's, you're really looking at patterns, right? Um, so the first thing, and see, this is my weakness. When people bring me an ornamental plant, I look at it and I think, I have to ask, what plant is this? <laughs> right? If I don't know the plant, I don't maybe don't know how to diagnose it, right? And so that's what this shows. It's like, well, this is natural. This is due to a virus. This is due to spider mite. This is a nutritional disorder. You see, now if I didn't know what the natural color is of that plant and that variety, I might make a diagnosis. So first you gotta, you gotta know what plant you're dealing with. And likewise here, all right? We have yellow spots, which is natural. We have black spots, which is not good. What roses, right? So, where is the problem going to start in this field? And then, you know, sometimes, like when I walk in the field, say, so you be, if you it's scattered, that says one thing to me. If it's all clustered like that, that says another thing to me. So, scattered would mean we had a windstorm and a flight of insects came in and they landed like thrips, and we get spotted will randomly in the field where that thrips fit on the tomato. This here would mean, well, we had a nematode that got introduced, and over the years, it just slowly spreads, and so we have poor growth in this area. This here, I actually had this once. I was sitting in a pepper field, and they were saying, oh, gee, look at those peppers, that whole strip is stunted. And I was asking them questions and said, oh, yeah, 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 just wait. Back there, that's where grandma's house used to be. Yeah. All right? And it was a driveway that, you know, that they had renovated, and so you had all this compaction 
And what, but it might be a waterway, like Phytophthora is a big problem. If you have it on one plant and you have other plants, it'll just move where the water flows. Right. So it's just understanding the nature of the beast. So where is the problem going to start in this field? Right? This is Sampson County. So you want to be you want to be conscious of how you manage your water and the water flow, right? A disease that loves water will start like that. And I have some sad stories. 60 acres of peppers. All right? It started just like that. He came, he called me one time and said, Frank, you got to look at my peppers. And it was just a little hot spot in this field. And then we had two windstorm events. One was a hurricane. And that disease walked through 60 acres of his peppers. And, 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 and he's a fifth generation farmer. I said, Frank, if I ever have another year like that, I will lose my farm. Right? So it's really, really devastating. Likewise, this grower put in 30 acres of peppers. You see, all the peppers are planted. Soon after planting, every single one die. Right? Because that disease, that pathogen, is in the watering system. And then he's pumping water into each of these beds with the drip irrigation. Right? So it's just understanding the nature of the beast and then how to manage that. Right? So uh, phytophthora is really common in home gardens and um, you know, with, with certain types of trees uh, that, you, that you get. Okay, these are tomato plots, right? So I often think, well, did it happen quickly or did it happen over time? These are, this is a Mills River. These are actually tomato plots that we had. And then a short while later, they all look like this. Like, that's pretty, pretty bad. Yeah. Well, that's why. Because there's our tomato plants right there. Okay. And so this was in 2004, we had 21 inches of rain. Tomatoes don't like that much rain. <laughs> you know, one time I was, uh, it was a Friday afternoon, and this farmer called me and he said, Frank, you got to come to my cabbage field. He goes for me to cabbage. He says, something is killing my cabbage. And it happened overnight. Right? Now, usually when someone says, well, it happened overnight, I think, well, you just haven't been in the field for two or three weeks, probably, right? But you've got to listen. He's telling me a pattern. What happened over time? All right, so I, I, I quickly go up there because he was very worried. Look at that. The plants here in the middle are completely, completely gone. And the further you get away, the, the less the symptoms are. See the browning on the tips? So I would take my knife, I'd cut it open, look at that. The inside of that cabbage plant is completely rotted out. It looks like soft rot, bacteria soft rot, you know, like the stuff that stings you. Like potatoes. Does anybody know what this is? This is an open pollinated cabbage. It's lightning damage. <coughs> yeah, isn't that something? So the lightning struck right here. And what happens is the energy goes up the middle of the plants and it just cooks the insides. And you'll see this in tobacco and tomatoes. And it just gets hollowed out on the inside, right? So, so uh, he was right. It did happen overnight. <laughs> he wasn't lying like I thought he was. <laughs> okay, and so what's the, what the prognosis is? We just had a good laugh. But he thought something killed those cabbage overnight, and I got 400 acres of cabbage out there, right? <laughs> and then a while later, he says, Frank, you got to come up. He says, I got this patch in my cabbage field. And the plants, they stand up, you know, and then in the daytime, they kind of wilt and lag. He says, and, and then at nighttime, they come back up, and he says, they're just kind of stunted. Well, listen to what he's saying. He's giving me information about time and space. So I go up there again. And um, yeah, look at that pattern. And when I cut the stem open, and you see this browning in the plumbing system. <laughs> and that browning is from Fusarium. Okay, it's a very and it's a disease. This is an open pollinated cabbage. Most cabbage have a single gene for resistance, so it's like F in cabbage, that gives complete control of this disease. So he knows not to grow open pollinated cabbage in this field. And genetic resistance will completely control it. You know, so this one here, this is a tomato greenhouse uh, here. That, that, that's a bit fuzzy, but if you look close, describe to me what you see in the symptoms. Just describe, let's say you were on the phone and you said, oh, Frank, I got something wrong with my tomatoes. Describe to me what you're seeing. 
Does someone want to take a shot at that? On, you know, just looking at this or looking at both? On the new growth. Aha. Okay, well that tells me something. Right away it's not nitrogen deficiency, that's the old growth. If it's not magnesium deficiency, that's the old growth. It has a different signature, so it's new growth. What else do you see in it? It's yellowing from the stem up. That is very strange. Nothing does that. So really, except Roundup. <laughs> okay, it's a very diagnostic signature. This person sprayed the weeds around his greenhouse, rinsed it three times, and then sprayed for whitefly or something. And there was enough residue in that tank to cause damage. Okay. And so Roundup, I say a few parts per million go a long way, you know? So it's amazing. And, and it's very common in gardens to see Roundup injury. And then, you know, over time, you get, you get a sense, and you know, when you talk to people, um, like certain times, certain diseases occur, and under certain patterns. So I often ask about, what was the weather like? Or, you know, I think about what season we're in, you know. So that's, and that's also going to help you decide when you might need to, um, you know, think about control measures. Because you don't need to control late blight of tomato until we know late blight is in North Carolina. What we do, when late blight comes to North Carolina, it bounces up from the southern states. Once late blight is in North Carolina, most growers will change the spray program if they're within 200 miles of that report. Okay. All right, but I always don't, I don't know what it is. And, and, you know, so that's the idea, just certain, knowing when certain diseases occur. So really, you know, we're trying to always figure it out, okay, when you're talking <coughs> to me, let's say if you're telling me a problem, I'm trying to think, is this a living factor? or a non-living factor. And you know, if it comes to the clinic, we re immediately check the pH and the salts. If it's a living factor, I'm trying to discern, you know, is it a fungus, a bacteria, a virus, or a nematode. Right? And then in North Carolina, we have great resources. You know, I'm a home gardener, but I send my, my, my samples, my soil samples into NCDA now and then just to see where my pH is, especially. Where's my phosphorus? You know, just so that I know if I need to line my land or not. All right. So that's that's one of the great um, tools that are available to you as as a as a home person or as a commercial person. And so you know, who who can you talk to? What are your books? Uh, what books are available to help diagnose it? And and this is the goal. Whenever you have a problem, the goal is to eliminate what the problem is not. Now a lot of times I'll get a sample. And I'll tell the grower, I don't know what it is. And they say, well, don't you work at state? I say, yeah. They say, <laughs> they say well, what good are you? Right? <laughs> OK. <laughs> but I don't know what it is, but I can tell you what it's not. It's not an infectious disease. It will not spread through your field. And it will not cause more damage than what you got. But I can't tell you what it is. But that's 100% that's diagnosis. That's very affirming, right? So a lot of times you gotta, you got to try and uh, figure out what it's not. And then discount the highly improbable and focus on the most likely. And, and I think just, you know, in your, it's, it's just fun to learn about the different insects, the different pathogens, and then what you can do with it. It's really sad when it kills your plants, right? Especially a value plant. Um, but that's, you know, so really we're trying to come up with a diagnosis and then figuring out what to do about it. Uh, in the case of that lightning, the, the, the outcome was we had a good laugh, right? In the case of that fusarium and cabbage, the outcome was he had to change his variety, at least in that field. And one thing, this is, I often use this for students, and this was very true, you know, when I was a new faculty. You're sitting in the field, and let's say 60 acres of peppers are dying, and the grower says, well, Frank, what do you think it is, and what should I do about it? I have phoned people in Israel to get their opinion. Right? The world's your limit. And so you can find a lot of information. So if I don't know, I just say, well, I don't know, but I will find out. And so that's really important. Okay, so then coming back to our triangle, what are some of the things that we can do when we have problems? And I'll just dance with a few of those. Let me skip that one. Um, some cultural control. Um, and, and I'm going to go beyond uh, pathogens here. I'm going to go into my garden a little bit more, a little bit more of a walk through my garden. 
I hate weeds. Right? Now, one of my problems is I get too busy and I should have weeded three weeks ago. Right? You know, I just get too busy. So what I try to do is I try to, uh, you know, this, this here is what you see in construction zones, that woven nylon fabric to for soil erosion control. It's pretty inexpensive. It's kind of like a plastic. So I, I bought 100 feet one time and I still have, actually it was 200 feet, and I still have a lot left. And I bought, I bought this 15 years ago. And then I have four kids, so with two of them, what I, uh, you know, I like them to work, I guess. I turned on my grill, and I got different sized cans, and then they melted the holes. Because if you just cut it, it will fray over time. But if you melt it, it seals that hole, so it doesn't fray, right? And then you can see here, I put it on a six by six hole uh, structure. Oh, look at, look at my leeks and onions. It's like almost no weeding, right? Because they can stand that six by six spacing, and it's not a lot of weeding. Here you can see uh, some, some kale, and it's on a, a 12 by 12 offset, right? And then for tomatoes, I just put a hole every 18 or 24 inches just down the middle. And see here, you can see I'm preparing the bed, and I'll put the drip tape in the middle of that bed, and then I hook it up to it. And it's all MacGyvering. You know, I don't spend a lot of money. I just, I just make it up as I go, kind of. You know, it's just, I don't spend a lot of money on materials. It's just, just doing what I can at, at home or buying at Walmart or Home Depot, uh, you know, and then, and then I can water that bed as needed and don't need to top water it. Because uh, the more I top water, the more I might induce diseases or damage the produce. So that's a cultural practice I use just to get a handle on, um, on weed management. The other thing I do is I try to get as much organic matter on this you know, leaves or whatever, but again, if I have time, which I didn't this year, I can plant cover crops on time. And, um, you know, so, so this is, you can see this is, a, this is a clover rye mix in the spring. And then what I do is I just, I just lay it down or I flail mow it at the right time. You know, there's a certain time when you get the maximum amount of nitrogen and it depends on the crop you use, right? So it's more for a late summer crop. I use it for tomatoes, not late summer, but late spring. Tomatoes, sweet potatoes, do really good under no-till. What I do in the fall, I hill my soil, and then I put the cover crop on, and then in the spring, I just lay it down flat, and then I put the sweet potato slips right through there in that hill, preformed. And then I, for, if, if I get a good residue like this, I almost have no weeds. So it works really well, you know. Uh, and again, I just have a rototiller. You know, I don't. I, I can use the exercise, right? Uh, here's a little lettuce back, some muscadine mix. I, I have this old patio door, and I shoot for the first of February to seed it. If it's warmer, I'll shoot. I'll, I'll shoot to uh, in the middle of January, and then I'll shoot again end of August. And I have some. Um, I must go and let us know that we're harvesting. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a little chilled right now. It's a little like 100 snow <laughs> snow. Um, and then, you know, I, I have this remay, you know. Um, so a lot of our growers, you'll see this, where they protect, frost protect for strawberries. Well, at some point, it becomes fragmented, broken. And so, um, you know, I can, I can get some spare parts. And in here, I'm protecting potatoes. You can see these got nipped by the frost on the top, but, but they'll put out a lot of new leaves, new shoots. So just different cultural practices to try and get, you know, good growth in the garden. <laughs> and sanitation would be another one. You know, this is really important with any plant, right? But to what extent can you clean up things to reduce the amount of problems, either diseases or insects? Uh, again, this is strawberries, so I, I grow them on this uh, fabric. Actually, this is a plastic, but the, mostly I use fabric now. Uh, and you can see I have a 12 by 12 hole. But this is, oh, after the winter, all those plants just look totally decimated. And all that dead tissue has botrytis in it. And that's the gray mold that you get on strawberries. It just rots. Well, I just, I just hand remove all that. So that's sanitizing. Remove dead and dying material. 
And to what extent is that important for the problem you have and the plants you have? Right? And so that just cleans it up really nice. And look at that. That's the garden here. Just one row I had. And uh, yeah, nice nice strawberry crop. And they're not moldy. Mm -hmm. And I don't spray. Right? Not these things. Potatoes. Anything that you have cuttings of or you bring from somewhere else, you should make sure, if possible, get it from a certified nursery and is disease free. Because you don't want to introduce a disease, you know, like Valerie was saying, you know, you don't want to bring down your seed or the propagation material. So I buy certified potatoes, and uh, but here you can see I did get some soft rot, I get some insect injury, get the hole in there. This is bad here. This is um, a disease called shovel damage. <laughs> Uh, but you see here where I had, uh, I just showed uh, the, the different <coughs> kind of practices I have. What I do with potatoes a lot of times, I will, I'll have the rye, and then I will just leave a six inch strip where I kill the rye in uh, end of January, and then I plant potatoes first of March, the first of February is my goal. No, no, end of February, sorry, end of February, early March. And then I let the potatoes grow and the rye grow. And once the potatoes start going up, I just, Flayable or lay that residue down, and it just really covers everything up nice you know, for weed management. And you can see, yeah, we've got, got a nice crop of potatoes that year. Um, and then finally, therapeutics. You know, sometimes you might need to spray. And then will it be a biological, organic, or uh, you know, some kind of fungicide? That's a decision you would need to make. Um, I uh, this is my lovely wife Helen. These are peaches, and I tried to grow peaches without spraying. Mm -hmm. And in my neck of the woods, it cannot be done. <laughs> and you see, you get brown rot, right? And it just, it just will take 100% of the crop. So look at this, man. I had to put wood under these trees to keep them up. Most years, we get frosted out. In Lewisburg, we're just in this cold pocket, and Boy, but when we get lots of peaches, it's like a new honeymoon. You know, my, li my wife loves peaches. <laughs> and she grew up in Niagara Falls, which is, in, this is what she did for her summers, pick peaches. In the Niagara Falls area, we call it the banana belt of Canada. <laughs> where we don't grow bananas, but we grow a lot of peaches and grapes and limes, right? And we love canning, so you can see there's a lot of canning. And of course, any time of the year, we can have peaches and ice cream and stuff like that. So. And uh, yeah, also genetic resistance. I want to touch base on that. This is, uh, you know, you don't often hear this of grafting vegetables, right? When you buy an apple tree, it's usually grafted. Pear trees, a lot of ornamental trees, woody ornamentals are grafted because you want the right roots that can tolerate North Carolina conditions, but you want the lovely flowers. So this is back to the root. And what we do is we get roots that don't get the disease, and then we put this on, we call this YFT. This would be your favorite tomato. <laughs> All right, so it could be an heirloom, it could be, you know, any tomato you normally grow. So if you have a garden and you have bacterial wealth, what you want to do is get a bunch of your neighbors together and graft some plants, get the right seeds, and you can graft them yourself. You can graft one plant, we have a new company in North Carolina, they can graft, graft 200,000 per week, <laughs> right? And so, but you can see, the question is, to graft or not to graft? This is the question. <laughs> this is in Jackson County, all right, the grower has bacterial will. And you can see where we had grafted plants, it's 100% plant stand, without grafting, almost 100% plant death. So we put, the, we put, we, we help the growers get back on what they call their money land. We give them new roots to these plants, they grow the variety that meets their market, it costs more per plant. I remember once when I talked to a grower about this, he says, Frank, I can't do that. He grows 300 and something acres of tomatoes, right? He said, if I have a hailstorm, I'd lose a lot of money. It's too much risk. Then he did a bunch of trials, and then he phones me a while later and he says, Frank, I'm going to try some grafted plants. I said, well, that's really great. I'm excited about that. I said, how much are you going to put in? I thought, an acre, five acres. He says, I'm going to put in 20 acres. I said, and I, I said his name, I said, I said, if you put in 20 acres, I won't be able to sleep at nights. <laughs> I'm not sure we had the science enough, right? But he saw it, he saw it. 
you know, tomatoes or no tomatoes. And I don't right? And he was, they were losing a lot of <laughs> tomato production. They were starting to grow um, peppers and cucumbers, but, you know, with the grafting, they put their money back into tomatoes. And you can do it, you know, we, you, uh, I think over time you'll start gra uh, getting more plants. Um, grafted plants on the market. But anyhow, this is the final shot, you know, just um, Helen and myself. This is one day I just went out there and just harvested what was ready. We'll get the lights turned on. And, and, uh, and okay. we have some This is the first year we've had the dimes. This was actually last year, 2017. And in an herb garden. Yeah. And so, um, you know, uh, oh, I have, I guess I have some more, uh, more shots. So I'm just back to this department. And, you know, the joy it is to be part of this department. And I've been in that state for 23 years, but I really, really enjoy the heart department. And I've always worked, um, you know, in the horticultural industry with a lot of the faculty there. All right, then uh, this is my family. See, that's my son who was really small there. And, um, this is a young boy that we fostered for a while. And not sitting on a bed of roses, but smelling the roses. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, oh, then this, the backwoods and beavers took it over. And, uh, it's a whole, whole change in the ecology. It's really, really interesting. And snakes, yeah, lots of snakes. Yeah. We get the black rat snakes taking our eggs. And but I hope that gave you a flavor, you know, of, of how to problem solve. It's really about pattern analysis. And, I, you know, of course it applies to more than just plant diseases and plant problems. But, um, you know, also maybe some ideas that might help you, at least with vegetable garden. Um, and then, I don't know, Chris, what time it is and how much time we have. And well, if we have time I think you have just the right amount of time. All right. Yeah. <laughs> we'll get the lights turned on. Questions. Yeah. You want to throw a couple his it, way. It doesn't have to be about diseases or anything. I've heard you can't grow tomatoes in the same place because of diseases. Is that true? That's true with tomatoes. So the question is, uh, you shouldn't grow tomatoes because of diseases, and that's really true. You should you should try to have at least a three-year plan of moving to different <coughs> parts of the land. Some of our organic growers have a nine-year plan, you know, so they're really really strict about it. But that's true. A lot of the organisms I showed. They build up over time, like nematodes or soil diseases. They build up over time in the same soil. And so you really should get away from it. So the, what I say, I say disease is an exception. You say, well, Frank, that's not true. I have a lot of plants that get diseases. I see it every year. But it is true. Most diseases occur on very specific plants at very specific times. It's an exception. And even with tomatoes, you know, you can buy seed that's F1, F2, F3. <coughs> so an F1 means it doesn't get one type of strain of fusarium. F2 means it doesn't get another type of strain. These are different races, we call them. So it's an exception that a fusarium can attack a tomato. Because that fusarium only attacks tomato. It won't attack watermelon. It won't attack any other crop. They're very specific, a lot of diseases. <coughs> So when someone calls me and says, oh, I got this spot on my tomatoes, and you know what, it's showing up on my beans. Right away, it's not a disease, probably ozone injury, right? I mean, that's just, because, because a disease is an exception. It won't occur on both of those type of crops, usually. There's, there's a few exceptions to the exception. It's kind of like learning French. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so is that helpful, Valerie? Yeah. Well, we to grow them. So yeah, okay. next year, if I put a pot on top of the ground, will that negate the diseases that could be in there? It will if you put something between the ground <coughs> and the pot so that there's an air layer. Because if your roots grow through the pot into the soil, and they will, then they'll pick up the disease. Oh. But if you just put like a mm -hmm. styrofoam container or something, or bricks, so that when the roots come out, they will air prune. Mm -hmm. And then, then they won't go into that soil. Yeah, so I mean that's the challenge, right? We only have so much, so much land, and you know, so you you need to rotate. I mean, you can't rotate. Yeah, yeah. Usually you can get away for two or three years, and and you let the. Uh, I, I tell. Uh, uh, I, I I tell a lot of people. I let the plants speak to me. 
You know, it'll tell you when it's starting to feel sick and tired, and you know, you know, okay, there's probably something wrong with that soil or something. You know, so, so as much as you can, you can you can grow it there, and then when it's not working, maybe you gotta go to the pot system. Yeah, yeah, or find out what what it's causing it. If it's wilting suddenly, it might be fusarium, and if you change your variety, bang, you're back in business. Yeah, so good diagnosis is important. Yeah, we got one here and then one there. How do you find time to do your farming? Yeah. <laughs> you know, as department head, my garden is very, very poor this year. <laughs> I have to find that new sustainable balance. But you know what? It's, it's partly my recreation. Right? I get home. I like to garden for a while on weekends. And, um, uh, so yeah, it's, it's a recreational thing to, for me in many cases. But what I do is... You know, I know I want my potatoes planted at the end of February. I take a day off because otherwise I will not get done. I, I just look at the weather. I think, you know, I buy the potatoes ahead of time and cut them so that they heal before I plant them. So you have this nice healing. And then I just look at the weather and I think Wednesday's going to be a good day to plant them. And I just take the whole day off, plant my potatoes, my lettuce, my peas, a lot of the greens, you know, I'll put in, um, I'll put in, uh, you know, bok choy or the greens, you know, for uh, um, uh, leafy greens for eating. So, so that's one way I do it. Is I actually just schedule time. Yeah, because otherwise it doesn't get done. You know, and same with weeding. You know, sometimes I just have to take time off. So I, this year I put an heirloom tomato Oh, yeah. Do you think the heirlooms are more resistant for some reason to... Usually not. Usually heirlooms have less resistance. But, but sometimes what's really interesting is some, sometimes plants produce volatiles or perfumes that attract, you know, the insects. And, um, and, and, and the science is amazing. You know, we're start, starting to see people design chips that can smell the plant. And based on the smell of the plant, they can tell what kind of stress it is. And then that chip tells your cell phone, I'm in trouble. <laughs> All right? Now, you might not do that for your garden tomato, but if you had 300 acres, it's important for you to know. So I think, I think that might be it. It might be something that just makes it more attractive. There's usually not good resistance to insects. It might be more of an attractive thing. Because uh, both Better Boy heirlooms they don't have, uh, you know, to my knowledge, strong resistance to, to insects. But that's interesting. And was it hornworm, or do you think? Little black, or? Little black worm. And oh. In the oh, in the fruit. And, and they were the bigger you know, tomato, as opposed to the heirloom with the cherry tomato. Yeah, okay. Well, I feel like those right, are okay. easier to grow because they don't you know, and, and that's true. Cherry tomatoes generally are very tolerant to a lot of diseases and, and problems. You know, when a lot of your other ones get early blight, your cherry tomatoes are often doing okay. So they, they do inherently seem to have more, more resistance. Yeah, yeah. Got here and then they'll go there. You mentioned a disease on English ivy. What is it and where can I get it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. That's a good PhD question. You want to you wanna come work for us? <laughs> Three years, you might have it solved. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's, that was from North Carolina. That's a, that's a bacterial disease. Unfortunately, it does make it look ugly but it's hard to make it kill plants, you know? <laughs> you need constant rain and the right temperatures to really kill the plant. In English ivy, it tends to be pretty resilient. <laughs> Great question. I'm just curious about fighting bugs with other bugs. Yeah. And how, how many years, I mean, is it, how quickly can you actually see results? Well, a lot of times, so it depends on your system. So. I can, I can give you an example of commercially, you know, in greenhouses, and then give some examples of, um, of like, uh, just thinking about home gardening. So in greenhouses, there's, there's white flies that can be a severe problem. So they can buy parasitic wasps, and, and you can put them in your greenhouse, and they will feed on the white flies, 
right? And and you can get control, you know, that that sees it. And you got to be conscious because you got to you got to change the way you prune tomatoes because those parasitic wasps tend to be on certain types of leaves, and you don't want to be pruning those leaves and then throwing them out of the greenhouse. So you got to you got to change a few practices. I think in general, you know, and so I'm not a strong entomologist, you know, uh, with insects, but in general, anything you do to enhance diversity in different types of plants and mixing plants, you know, so even like say with tomatoes, if you plan to have an early planting and a late planting, and if you have a space, keep them separate because the early planting will be a great source of problems for the later planting. But if you can keep them spatially separated, that'd be good. Like me, I have small gardens, but I have about four of them. You know, so I, I try to spatially separate things. And so I think just, just trying to manage diversity, and there's a, there's a lot of good literature on certain plants will attract certain types of beneficials, which then will control um, you know, other insects. And again, the science is amazing. A plant, when it's being fed on by a certain caterpillar, will emit certain volatiles or perfumes that attracts a parasitic wasp to come and parasitize that caterpillar. It's just amazing, you know, the, how, how that's unfolding. Uh, so, so, so then you think, you know what, we, we're kind of breeding tomatoes all wrong. We're always breeding them for taste. But maybe we've got to breed them so they produce these volatiles that will attract the beneficials. We've kind of bred it out of them, maybe. You know? So th those are some of the things, I think, where we're seeing the science go. And it's pretty exciting, I think. It's like, who would have thunk? You know, that plants are crying out for help, right? <laughs> Using these volatiles, yeah. I grow broccoli every single year. And almost every single year I get the little green worms yeah. buried all the way down into the broccoli. Yeah. Last year I decided to plant about six garlic plants oh. all the way around yeah. the broccoli. I had two worms on about ten plants last year. Yeah, okay. It was amazing. So whatever you whatever aromatic is coming off of that garlic plants yeah. are keeping those worms away. Yeah. Or bringing in the wasps that you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So either one, and I'm not... I don't think I'm the wasps are going to be there in February, March. But. Yeah, and I'm not specifically sure, but I think those are the tricks of the trade we need to learn more. You know, when Grandma says, oh, put the marigolds in, yeah. it's like, maybe Grandma's right. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's, that's it, you know. Um, the other way is to try and, uh, you know, put in your broccoli earlier so that you're pretty well done before those moths start to fly in. But, yeah, or, or you know, if you are organic, there's some pretty good organic materials for, you know, BTs and stuff like that that, that are organically uh, allowed. Yeah. Any ideas for preventing or dealing with the stem borers that get in the squash vines? And Ooh, that's a great question. When you find the answer, let me know. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the squash wine borer. And you know what? The answers are there, but I don't know them. You know, so, so there are, you know, those answers are out there, but I don't know. And my zucchini always collapse. And so I haven't pursued that answer. Yeah, but the answer's out there. Yeah. Somebody told me last year to try radishes around, plant the radishes oh. such that they're growing around the mound that you put your squash okay. and zucchini in. Yeah. Okay. Just a clue, try it, see what yeah. happens. Yeah. But make sure that they're planted and growing before you put the squash seeds in. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So those are the tricks of the trade that we need to you know that you learn from your neighbors. Yeah. With some of the seed varieties and peppers and whatnot, are there certain ones we should avoid because it's too darn hot and humid here? Um so the question is, there's so many different varieties of peppers, you know, are there certain ones that we should avoid? The answer is probably yes, but I don't, I don't know, I don't know enough about the varieties. Um, you know, there is, like in tomatoes, there's a tomato breeding program to get hot set tomatoes, so the flowers don't fall off when it hits like really hot temperatures. And, and, and there are probably for peppers also. And peppers are more sensitive than tomatoes. You know, they tend to be a little more susceptible to stress. So, cooler. right, right, because of the heat, probably. And you know what? A lot of times I grow peppers, I get a spring crop, I just let them kind of putter through the whole summer, and then I'm, I'm going to get some stuff off the fall still mm -hmm. if they don't get decimated by something else. But I don't, again, that answer is probably known, 
you know, if, 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 if I was to do my homework, that there's certain varieties that, might, that t tolerate the heat better than others. Because there are specific breeding programs to do that. And they grow a lot of peppers in New Mexico, and it gets hot there for you. <laughs> so, yeah, so certain, yeah. And I, so I don't know, that I couldn't say, oh yeah, Cal Wonder is really susceptible, and you know, uh, King Arthur is not, or something like that. Same with tomatoes? Same with tomatoes, yeah, that's right, yeah. You know, there's, there's, uh, there's not a lot of, in, in the regular market, I don't think there's a lot of hot set tomatoes. You know, but there are breeding programs to get hot set tomatoes. I, I don't know of any, you know, there's some commercial lines that are available, but I don't know about heirlooms and stuff like that off yet. I, I, you know, I take my hits. We just grow a lot of different heirlooms and I grow a lot of different types and, yeah, so, but, yeah, but, but, you know, if you have a limited number, because I got more space and plant more plants, right? Mm -hmm. But, but it would be worthwhile pursuing. Uh, you know, that information is out there, I'm sure, and I just don't know that offhand. Probably some of my department knows, right? <laughs> <laughs> Was there one more question for Frank tonight? What do you do about deer? A deer, yeah. <laughs> one, my, uh, that son I showed you is 16 now, he knows how to shoot a gun. <laughs> Two, I, I do fence. Uh, so I, and so there's a trick, all right? And I, sh I, sh I showed you that one picture where that cover crop is and you can see the fence. So it's just a regularly high fence. But they love sweet potatoes, and they'll jump that fence and eat my sweet potatoes. But what I do is I put a rope about two feet in from that fence, and I put it all the way around the garden, this rope. Because deer, they can measure height well, but they don't measure depth as well. And so when you have two lines, they don't know how to jump it. Okay, so, it's, so that's what I do, is I just take a regular fence, because I'm not going to build eight-foot fences, uh, you know, and then, and then I put this rope inside of that, and that does work. And there's other ideas that people have slant fences again. It's not high, but the deer can't really judge the distance of where it needs to land, because it can't read that, that slant fence. So that's, that's some of the things. I don't know, what about other people? What, don't grow hostas, I guess. But the area where the inner fence was really confining. Oh, okay. So deer psychology is they don't want to jump into a pen. Yeah. So they if they jump in they can't get out maybe. Yeah. yeah. Never went in there. But it yeah. was a small area, it was maybe ten by sixteen or so. Okay. They would jump in there. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Bunch of great questions. Yeah. Thank you so much for all the questions. And thank you, Frank, for a great